right. Good afternoon. So uh, we are back with our stochastic block model. Remember, this is this random graph model, which has an underlying block structure. And our aim is to uh, try and reconstruct this block structure from the observation of the graph. So that's depicted in a picture here. And so uh, we left it uh, yesterday at the point where I was telling you that the classical methods uh, that we want to use uh, in general, these are spectral methods which uh, tend to uh, process the adjacency matrix of the graph, extract the eigenvectors associated with the largest eigenvalues, and then cluster according to the entries, all right? So why does that fail in the, uh, in the sparse setting that we are considering here? So let's first see that. Uh, it fails because uh, the eigenvectors associated with uh, uh, large eigenvalues tend to be localized. So they may have uh, their entries in a, a, a small support, and this will tell you nothing about the, the cluster structure. So let's try to uh, get a, a, a feel for this. Let's see first that there do exist some uh, uh, large eigenvalues for which the corresponding eigenvectors are localized and uh, will not be helpful for clustering. So uh, uh, here's the simplest argument that I know of if uh, you want to get that. Uh, it's to uh, first look at the uh, case where you don't have a block structure. So that's the uh, Erdos-Renyi random graph. And so uh, look at structures in this graph that are isolated stars. So that would be nodes which have a collection of neighbors and they are not connected to the rest of uh, the nodes and uh, their neighbors are not connected between them, all right? And so I might uh, consider for node I whether it's the center of a star with uh, D uh, branches, okay? Uh, and so, uh, there's one thing that you can take as an exercise that if uh, you consider a uh, Nerdos Schreni graph uh, with uh, n nodes and uh, p equals lambda over n as the probability of uh, an edge being present, so lambda being of order one. Uh, so uh, if now you consider d to be uh, given by some uh, small constant c times log n over log log n, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and you take c to be less than one, then you will have many such isolated stars in your graph. And uh, uh, okay, if you if you want to to uh, try to to show it by yourself, you could uh, uh, prove first that the uh, expected number of uh, D uh, stars of that kind uh, goes to infinity as N goes to infinity, and that the uh, variance of the uh, uh, number of, uh, of D stars like that uh, is negligible compared to the uh, square of the expected number of such D stars squared. So if you have those two things, uh, then you can call upon the uh, uh, so-called uh, second moment method to prove that the number of such objects uh, goes to infinity with a, a, a high probability, okay? Because you can use a bien aimé Chebyshev uh, inequality and show that uh, with high probability, you have many such objects. All right, and this is the case for that particular scale. So we have uh, um, <clears throat> such objects in the graph. Uh, if now you think of the adjacency matrix, this will produce um, the peron frobenius eigenvalue of the corresponding graph. So that will be, uh, that is something that you can figure out. It's an easy computation. And this peron frobenius eigenvalue will be a, a given by the square root of the number of branches. Okay, so sorry. So if you have a, a matrix, square matrix with non-negative entries, uh, the Peron-Frobenius theory tells you that 
it admits a, a positive scalar eigenvalue and modulo some uh, irreducibility assumption. Uh, uh, this is the eigenvalue with the largest modulus. Uh, and uh, so in that case, uh, you can figure it out. So the adjacency matrix of a star graph has uh, uh, as its largest modulus eigenvalue, that is the pair of Frobenius eigenvalue, uh, uh, the square root of the number of branches. So you get uh, by this argument that uh, in your uh, original graph, you have many uh, eigenvalues which are of order square root of C uh, log n over log log n. So large eigenvalues, they go to infinity with n. And if you think of the corresponding eigenvector, it is supported by the, uh, by the uh, vertex set of the star. And so it's a localized eigenvector. It does not tell you anything about its support, does not tell you anything about the uh, uh, block structure, which uh, in our stochastic block model consists of macroscopic blocks of order n nodes. Uh, so that's uh, the exercise you can do in the, in the setting of the Erdos-Schrenny graph, but uh, exactly the same kind of argument goes through when you consider instead the stochastic block model in the sparse regime we consider. So again, we have existence of uh, uh, eigenvectors associated with large eigenvalues uh, whose, eigenvec whose eigenvector is uh, localized and not useful for, uh, for clustering. And conversely, you can also uh, ask are there uh, perhaps other eigenvalues for which the corresponding eigenvector uh, is uh, non-localized? And it turns out that if the eigenvalue is large, the eigenvector is localized in some sense. So there's uh, really strong evidence that you cannot do anything, anything with either the Laplace uh, matrix of the graph or the adjacency matrix of the graph. So uh, this is why we need to uh, do what uh, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Florent Jacala et al. Uh, called the spectral redemption. We need to redeem uh, spectral methods in order to, to do clustering in that setting. Uh, so let me give you, uh, before I, I tell you what they meant by spectral redemption, let me tell you first uh, an earlier conjecture that was made in this uh, uh, stochastic block model. Uh, you can if you uh, think again of the relationship between this uh, random graph model and the tree model we were describing first, you can uh, um, use belief propagation as a way to try and estimate uh, spins or blocks uh, in the graph. Uh, and so this is the, the equation I'm writing here uh, on the top uh, of the slide. Uh, so you take your graph and um, you can consider each uh, oriented edge, say, uh, so here that would be I, J, a pair of edges, you consider some orientation. And uh, now uh, you want to compute somehow uh, the conditional distribution of the spin at node I, given uh, the observation of uh, the neighborhood at distance D uh, of the graph away from J, all right? And maybe you would know something about the uh, spins uh, far away at distance D. So <clears throat> that's the, uh, um, the setting you might, you might uh, consider. And so uh, if you knew uh, the conditional distribution of uh, the spin at node i given some faraway information uh, away from j, then uh, you could uh, uh, bring together such information for many neighbors of, of uh, uh, node j and okay, propagate it along the edges. And so that's, that's what this equation does here. Or uh, it tells us, uh, uh, maybe I, have I done it? Yeah, I think I've done it in the right uh, direction. So to uh, get the message, the belief propagation message from I to J, I can uh, uh, combine the messages that I receive from its other neighbors, okay? So uh, you can uh, construct an algorithm which is initialized for each oriented edges 
by some, say, random distribution on the collection of blocks. And iteratively, you update those messages using belief propagation. So the conjecture that was done in uh, 2011 by Aurelien Dessel et al. is the following one. It says that if you are above the keston stigum threshold, that is to say if the uh, average degree alpha of your random graph times the square of the uh, second eigenvalue of this uh, stochastic matrix P is above one, then uh, initializing BP with random weights, iterating it sufficiently many times, it would converge to a fixed point, and this fixed point would carry some meaningful information about the block structure. So uh, today, this is not proven. Uh, numerically, this seems to be true. There's a numerical evidence uh, uh, <coughs> towards this conjecture, uh, but it's still open because it's very challenging to analyze uh, the uh, fine properties of belief propagation in sparse regimes like that. Uh, so uh, motivated by that, uh, uh, a subset of the team in the Dessel et al. paper, together with other people, there was uh, uh, Elkanan Mossel who joined the, the forces at that time, they decided uh, to uh, cook up a spectral method that would uh, be based on linearization of belief propagation. So uh, uh, recall we had uh, messages that consist in uh, distributions over the Q uh, blocks. Uh, okay, so Psi from I to J is a distribution. We know that belief propagation admits this fixed point that is the uh, uh, fixed uh, stationary distribution new in uh, uh, for our stochastic matrix P. So why not linearize belief propagation? Say, uh, assume that the message Psi I to J uh, <coughs> coordinate S is a, a small perturbation of uh, the stationary probability new sub S. So if you parameterize things uh, in that way, you can take the belief propagation equations, linearize them, so uh, uh, just retain the first order uh, coefficients, here are those uh, epsilon I to J uh, sub S for any spin value uh, S, and you get uh, for the uh, belief propagation once linearized, uh, uh, an interesting structure, namely your vector of uh, uh, perturbed quantities, uh, epsilon, is updated by being multiplied uh, by uh, a matrix. So the dimension of this thing is the oriented edges. So for each edge, we can pick two orientations. Uh, and for each oriented edge, we get Q coordinates, one per uh, block. Okay, so we have uh, uh, oriented edges times uh, blocks uh, as, as the dimension. And so this uh, <coughs> vector is updated by being multiplied by a matrix that is a tensor product of a matrix indexed by the oriented edges, uh, <coughs> Kronecker product with a, a matrix that is uh, indexed by the blocks. And this is the stochastic matrix P, the one uh, that depends on the blocks. So let's now look a little bit more at uh, the matrix that depends only on the graph structure and not on the parameters of the model. That is the B matrix in this equation, which is uh, known also as the non-backtracking matrix of the graph. Okay. Uh, so uh, by construction, its dimension is the number of oriented edges. So twice the number of edges in the graph. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in greater detail, so you can, you can uh, figure it out by yourselves uh, looking at the BP equations. Uh, you know that the BP messages, they flow in a particular way. You get uh, messages from an edge uh, to another edge if there is a, the two of them constitute a, a path of two hops, but there's no flow from an edge to itself backwards. So, it's hence the name non-backtracking. Okay, so uh, an entry of this matrix B for an edge E, uh, uh, for, for a pair of edges, oriented edges EF will be one if and only if the edges EF constitute an oriented a two hop path in the graph. And you get zero otherwise. In particular, you get zero if E feeds into F, but F is just the uh, reverse of E, right? 
So this is a matrix that's been studied in the past. In particular, people in, in number theory have, uh, uh, have uh, worked on it. Uh, we, we'll uh, see some of the early results on this matrix later on. And it's convenient, for instance, to count specific combinatorial structures on, the, on a graph. So uh, it's, it's quite clear that if you want to count paths, uh, oriented paths in the graph, starting from one edge, going to another edge with a number of edges in between, uh, say, uh, T edges, and you want to forbid back, uh, backtracks, namely, okay, in, if you want to count ordinary paths in a graph, you use the adjacency matrix. You raise it to some power and you get a count of, of paths. If you want to forbid backtracks, so let's say a path backtracks, if it goes uh, like this back to a, so I note I1, I2, and then if I3 equals I2, uh, I1, this is a backtrack, I want to forbid that. So if I want to count the number of, of non-backtracking paths from one oriented edge to another oriented edge of a given length, then I just need to uh, do uh, to raise this matrix B to the power of the length that I'm interested in, okay? Uh, all right, so uh, the spectral redemption is uh, the following thing, uh, where uh, usual spectral methods fail in those sparse models. Uh, spectral methods based on the matrix B associated with the graph uh, will succeed if we are above the Kestensteigum threshold. So th that's uh, what I want to uh, discuss in some detail now. The, the main results that we do have about the spectral structure of this matrix B for our stochastic block models and the consequences for spectral clustering based on the, the spectral uh, the, on the non-backtracking matrix B. Okay, so it will take a, a bit of notation. Um, so maybe some, hmm? right, why is it an, a good uh, idea? Is it uh, helpful for us to remove uh, backtracking paths? So you can think of uh, those uh, star structures that I was uh, uh, alluding to earlier on. So if you have a small star uh, like that in a, well, small, not so small, a, a star with D branches in a graph, so a high degree node, then uh, you will have uh, 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 many paths that uh, start and end at node I, but these will have to backtrack, okay? They can backtrack any number of times. So high degree nodes induce large eigenvalues in the adjacency matrix, uh, somehow because uh, they reflect the existence of uh, many uh, uh, paths that do backtrack and that uh, start and end at that node. Some, somehow uh, the backtracking paths are the reason why you do see uh, high eigenvalues with corresponding uh, localized eigenvectors in the adjacency matrix. And so we get some help by uh, removing backtracks. Okay. So um, first let me, let me introduce the notation to a state Point, you also that uh, if you don't allow path backtracks, you may still have uh, path going back to the sub, but this length is very long, right? Yes. So it, this contributes less. Yes, yes. It, it's uh, in, in uh, random graphs, like the ones we consider, you tend to have uh, short cycles, but very few of them. So you, you know that the number of triangles, say, uh, is of order one. So you may, you, you do have, uh, so if you have a node that is in a triangle like this, uh, so you will have non-backtracking paths that can uh, circle this triangle, okay? Uh, but since we have not too many triangles, this is not uh, uh, something that matters. Uh, so if uh, you consider a generic node in this graph, 
it won't have it won't be part of short cycles the shorter cycles it will belong to will be of length order log n and so uh, backtracking paths of length uh, smaller than some constant times log n uh, will not will not uh, uh, contain cycles uh, okay some notation so uh, Remember, we had these uh, uh, two parameters for our model, alpha, the average degree, p, the stochastic matrix, and we called m uh, the mean progeny matrix. It's just alpha times p. So uh, it turns out that the spectrum of this matrix m is going to be uh, important in uh, our analysis of the spectrum of the non-backtracking matrix b. Uh, so we'll uh, call lambda i of m the uh, eigenvalues of uh, m uh, ordered by decreasing uh, uh, eigen, by decreasing absolute value. So the peron frobenius eigenvalue of this mean progeny matrix is going to be alpha, the average degree, and we'll have only uh, smaller uh, uh, absolute values for the uh, next eigenvalues lambda two of m, etc. Okay, so. Uh, we'll be able to relate the eigenvalues of B to the eigenvalues of M, uh, and we'll also be able to relate the eigenvectors of uh, M to the eigenvectors of B. But here we need to do something because eigenvectors of M are Q-dimensional, the number of blocks, whereas B is, is size twice the number of edges. So we need to lift somehow the eigenvectors of, of P or M uh, in order to get candidate eigenvectors for B. So the lifting operation is what uh, is described on the, in the second paragraph. Uh, it works as follows. I pick a Q-dimensional eigenvector of uh, M associated with uh, some eigenvalue lambda I of M uh, for each oriented edge U to V uh, of the graph. I define a lift of uh, the uh, Q-dimensional eigenvector by saying that uh, vector Y sub I at coordinate E will take value X sub I of the spin of node uh, V, okay? Uh, so I assign to each oriented edge a coordinate of the Q-dimensional eigenvector that corresponds to the spin of the uh, uh, end of the edge, right? Okay. So I get my lift. And this is not good enough. This won't be close to an eigenvector of B. But if I uh, apply B a sufficiently large number of times to this lift, then I will get something that is close to an eigenvector of B. So that's what I do. I take a parameter that is a, a log n uh, times some uh, tiny constant. And so uh, eventually I have a candidate eigenvector for B that is uh, uh, denoted ZI and that is B to the L times the lift YI, oh, all right? And so now I'm uh, ready to read the statement. Uh, so uh, this works as follows. Uh, consider uh, uh, eigenvalues, so, um, Remember this uh, uh, Kesten-Stigum condition. This was stated as the second largest eigenvalue of M has a modulus squared uh, that is larger than uh, lambda one of M that is alpha. Okay, so that was my, uh, my <coughs> Kesten-Stigum condition was saying lambda two of M squared is larger than lambda one of M. So let me define R zero to be uh, the rank uh, the, the largest i at which this uh, Kesten-Stigum condition is met, okay? So it will certainly be met for i equals one. If I am above the Kesten-Stigum threshold, it will also be met for i equals two, and maybe it will be met for i equals five, but then uh, stop being met. So R zero is the largest index for which it is met. Uh, and uh, the statement is then as follows. Uh, below for, for the eigenvalues that are above the kesten stigum threshold. So that is eigenvalues of index uh, uh, no larger than uh, R0. Then the corresponding uh, 
eigenvalue lambda i of b, that is the highest largest eigenvalue of b, largest in modulus, converges in probability as my uh, graph becomes large to uh, lambda i of m. So I have the, the spectra of the two matrices that coincide for those uh, meaningful eigenvalues. Uh, I know as well that uh, there is an eigenvector uh, <coughs> Uh, that is obtained by the lifting procedure I described uh, that will be uh, uh, parallel to an eigenvector of B. So my construction indeed produces candidate eigenvectors that are uh, asymptotically aligned with the uh, actual eigenvectors of, of B. So that's when I'm above the kesten stigum threshold. For uh, indices I uh, larger, and larger than R0, uh, I can only say that the corresponding eigenvalue of the uh, non-backtracking matrix B in uh, modulus is at most square root of alpha uh, plus some little o of one. Okay, so that's that's the description that we get, and we get more information actually uh, on the eigenvectors, but I'm not going to detail uh, that. And so uh, perhaps the picture. Uh, so these are asymptotics that kick in reasonably quickly if you simulate uh, uh, random graphs of that uh, stochastic block model with a few hundreds of nodes. Uh, here that was the case with two symmetric blocks. You see uh, those asymptotics kick in. So for instance, here we are above the kesten stigum threshold. So we have uh, Q equals two. So we have two eigenvalues for matrix M. And we see both of them induces uh, an eigenvalue in the spectrum of B that is close by. Uh, and so they are outside the bulk of B where we call the bulk of B, the uh, uh, collection of eigenvalues that are within a, a, a disk of, uh, of radius, the square root of parameter alpha. Okay, so we see this uh, asymptotic behavior kicking uh, uh, rather quickly. Uh, okay, so uh, let me let me uh, uh, right away state uh, the corollary about clustering. So we, we can work a bit more. Uh, Q, Q by Q. Q is the number of, of blocks. Of blocks. Yes. Yes, so they are of size Q. Yeah. And so uh, if I want to uh, produce a candidate eigenvector for the B matrix, which is of size twice the number of edges or the number of oriented edges, I do a lifting procedure. So I first create a vector of size uh, twice the number of edges, which has uh, for, for uh, an oriented edge E uh, U to V, it uh, has uh, as its entry uh, the uh, entry of the q-dimensional vector that is an eigenvector of m and uh, i take the entry that corresponds to the uh, uh, spin of the endpoint of the uh, of the and so this is in 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 that uh, thanks to that the uh, eigenvectors of b will in fact uh, be correlated with the spins of the nodes because the eigenvectors uh, happen to be uh, constructed when well, they, they are close to vectors constructed from the spins at the nodes. No, 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 no. These are parameters of the model, so you cannot do a, but the fact that uh, uh, their, co their coordinates will show up, but the, the, correct, the coordinate that impacts an edge, uh, the coordinate of an edge in the uh, uh, eigenvector, uh, will be the coordinate corresponding to the spin of uh, the endpoint of that edge. Okay, so the eigenvectors of B uh, somehow reflect the, the block structure. Okay, so the, the precise statement that we get is, is the following for, uh, uh, for block reconstruction. So uh, assume you are above the Kesten-Stigum threshold. 
uh, take the eigenvector of B associated with the second largest eigenvalue. Okay, so that's uh, uh, this vector psi two. Uh, then we uh, bring it back to a size n. It's, you start with a vector uh, indexed by oriented edges. Now, uh, for a node u, uh, I would uh, uh, <coughs> construct the, the quantity phi of u, which is the sum of our uh, vectors pointing into u. Uh, so, uh, sum of our v that is a neighbor of u of psi 2 of v to u, the, the edge from v to uh, u. Uh, okay. Uh, so we want to have uh, entries per node of magnitude of order one. So this vector we can normalize so that its, uh, it's uh, Euclidean norm is exactly square root of n. Uh, and so the uh, rigorous statement that we, we could prove is the following. It holds in the case where the uh, measure nu is uniform. Okay. And so uh, we do a partition of nodes based on this vector. And uh, the thing that we can prove is for a random partition. What you would want to do in practice is take these entries. And then if it's positive, put it in one, uh, on one side. If it's negative, put it on the other side. And it seems that this does produce a meaningful clustering in practice. But the one for which we can prove something is a randomized clustering where uh, we put nodes into two uh, boxes at random, where the probability of ending in the plus box uh, is uh, given by one half plus one over two k uh, times this quantity phi uh, for the node that we are construing. So we want this to be a probability. So if this would go uh, above or, uh, one or below zero, we just uh, say nothing about this node. But if we pick the uh, parameter k large enough, uh, there's a vanishing fraction of nodes for which this happens. Uh, and uh, this clustering into two boxes achieves positive overlap according to the definition we have. Okay? And so this we can prove by uh, using fine properties of the eigenvectors uh, of the matrix B. Uh, but I'm not going to detail. Okay. Right. Are there any questions about the statements? No? Does this property lead to a uh, symmetry breaking of the uh, adjacency matrices? Uh, yes, it is uh, non symmetric, definitely. And in mm -hmm. fact, you can see that uh, on the plot here, mm -hmm. the spectrum is not real. It's definitely a, a complex spectrum. The bulk uh, occupies, uh, actually, does occupy the boundary mm -hmm. of this. Uh, disk of mm -hmm. uh, radius square root alpha. Uh, but next, you declared that uh, all block uh, uh, matrices are uh, symmetry. Uh, uh, well, what is uh, the connectivity? So, so uh, the non backtracking matrix is something mm -hmm. you can construct for any graph. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we, were, we have been discussing only non oriented graphs. Mm -hmm. So, graphs for which the adjacency matrix is uh, symmetric as well as the Laplacian matrix. So we, we have those classical matrices that are symmetric. They have a real spectrum. Uh, however, uh, the non-backtracking matrix that you can construct from any non-oriented graph is uh, generically non-symmetric, mm -hmm. okay? Because you cannot, uh, okay, if you, if you have one edge that uh, feeds into another one, uh, you don't expect, uh, so if, if it was a symmetric matrix, you would have uh, uh, also the entry uh, F to E would be equal to one as well. So it's definitely non-symmetric. Mm -hmm. So that's a non-symmetric construction from a well, non-oriented graph whose adjacent symmetrics is symmetric. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, all right, so the, the reference uh, on the spectral redemption is a paper by, in uh, 2013 by Jacala et al. Uh, in PINAS. Uh, so the, the theorem I was describing is something we proved uh, together with uh, Marc Lelarge and uh, Charles Bordenave. Uh, and uh, the proofs have become uh, simpler and simpler. In particular, there's a, the, perhaps the nicest version now is uh, that 
by Bordenav, Cost, and Alda Kuditin, 2020, but it's still not easy. Definitely, uh, it's quite a, a, a hard read still. Uh, and uh, some other simplifications were brought in, in works with my uh, PhD student, Ludovic Stefan. Uh, in particular, the uh, uh, randomized clustering here is uh, something that uh, uh, we developed with Ludovic. So I, I'll just try to give you, uh, uh, okay, uh, perhaps to, to sum up where we stand on this problem of clustering uh, into blocks uh, with a, a significant overlap. Uh, these uh, uh, graphs from the stochastic block model. So we have now a, a, a result. This spectral redemption thing uh, says that when you are above the kesten stigum threshold, you can uh, reconstruct in polynomial time, okay? So the plot here is, uh, is meant to illustrate the, the phase diagram as we know it. Uh, for the uh, Q, um, Q blocks case, uh, the X axis is the number of blocks. And uh, in the symmetric situation where you just have two more parameters needed to specify your model. So in your P matrix, you put one coefficient on the diagonal and another coefficient everywhere else uh, off the diagonal. And so the Y axis is the coefficient on the diagonal for the P matrix. And so we, we have a, a linear region here in this QA diagram, uh, which depicts the uh, above keston stigum region. So it is polynomial time feasible to uh, uh, cluster the nodes uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, we do have as well uh, uh, some uh, 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 bounds uh, on the region where uh, we know it's not going to be feasible even with unlimited computational power. These are the, the uh, scenarios where the associated tree reconstruction problem is uh, not feasible. So as I was telling yesterday, uh, if the tree reconstruction problem is infeasible, then uh, the uh, block reconstruction problem in the graph is infeasible as well. So we have a region where we know uh, no algorithm will, will produce a, a meaningful clustering. And the interesting thing is that there is a region in between uh, where we also know that a brute force algorithm can succeed, whereas we are below the kesten stigum uh, region. And so the consensus is, uh, uh, is the following. Uh, experts in this uh, area uh, believe that uh, uh, the threshold for polynomial time reconstruction is the kesten stigum threshold here. And uh, uh, that below that, you need uh, super polynomial time in order to cluster meaningfully the, the nodes. Uh, okay, so I'll just, uh, uh, okay. Maybe I, I'll just finish on some intuition for the, the uh, results. Uh, and I, I won't say much more than the intuition about the uh, uh, proof arguments for this, uh, this theorem. Um, so actually the intuition for why we can produce uh, 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 plausible eigenvectors for this non-backtracking matrix, it does come from uh, uh, the analysis of the tree problem we started from, and in particular, from this Martingale convergence property that I was uh, describing uh, when establishing that we had this, uh, what we call the census reconstruction uh, using a particular construction, exhibiting a Martingale and so on and so forth. So uh, here's what, uh, how the intuition uh, works. So uh, if, you, if you recall, we uh, produced a, a candidate uh, eigenvector uh, zi for an edge uh, e that is uh, u to v, let's say u to v. Uh, in the following manner, we had zi equals b to the l times yi, where uh, yi of uh, k to uh, eight, where well, let's say of f equals uh, w to t is precisely, so I had a q dimensional vector x sub i uh, taken at the value, the spin of node t, okay? I had 
this particular construction. So now if you think of what this means, if uh, in the vicinity of that edge, my graph has a tree topology, if I go not further than L hops away, then uh, you can uh, see that this entry here, this is precisely the sum along a non-backtracking path uh, that go, uh, so L hops away from this edge. So I have these non-backtracking paths. I have, so nodes here, all those nodes uh, uh, downstream at uh, distance L, say a node W. Then what I do is I sum over all those nodes. So I sum over such Ws precisely xi of the spin of those guys. And this is exactly the uh, martingale quantity I was constructing uh, the other, uh, yesterday, except that uh, I was normalizing in order to have a martingale. So our martingale was of this form, same thing except that I had alpha times lambda i of uh, p, uh, to the minus L, okay? And so now I can uh, uh, recall uh, what we, we had uh, uh, considered. There is a martingale uh, convergence theorem, which tells us that in uh, the tree setting, if uh, the parameter L becomes large, then the normalized quantity approaches a martingale limit, okay? I have this martingale limit. And so, uh, since uh, the uh, neighborhood of a node in the graph is close in distribution to the tree I, I was considering, I, I can, uh, <coughs> at least it's a plausibility argument, uh, I, I can hope that the quantity I have produced here, this is reasonably close to uh, the I of E, this is reasonably close to uh, the martingale limit up to this lambda i of p to the uh, plus l times, uh, say, uh, w of uh, e, where well, this is the martingale limit. So if I believe that, then I can now, uh, um, uh, well, the fact that the martingale converges says that if I do this construction with b to the l or b to the l plus one, this is the same uh, thing that I get except for a uh, change in the, in the uh, uh, coefficient here. And this is another way of saying that uh, my vector is approximately an eigenvector. So the Martingale convergence theorem tells me we, we get approximate eigenvectors and we get also an expression for the eigenvalue. So uh, this is the intuition and we can make this intuition work, but this is very technical, so this is why. I don't want to say much more, uh, just that, uh, okay. Yes. Yes, let's do that. Okay. Stop the sharing.